This is Real Estate Rookie episode 327. Three years ago, my fiance and I were living in my parents' basement when we decided to, uh, you know, that we wanted to buy a fix fixer upper house. And um, fast forward to today, uh, we have a small portfolio of single family and multifamily properties. Um, we have a mixed batch of short term and long term rentals. We self-manage everything um, together. I work in the business full-time and uh, she works uh, full-time at her W-2 job to you know, kind of provide us with a secure paycheck while I'm able to uh, risk the income we make from the business and continue to grow the business. My name is Ashley Kerr and I am here with my co-host, Tony J. Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and the stories you just really need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And uh, today we've got one of those really good stories to kind of give you that kick in the butt that you need to get started. There is a super inspirational story that just touched mine and Tony's heart about our guest today, Noah, going to BPCon in 2021. But Noah today is sharing how he rehabbed properties. He worked several different jobs that helped him a little bit understand uh, construction for real estate, but not really. And um, he goes through how he was able to learn. He talks about his second property being with a partner. And of course, we love partnerships here. Make sure if you haven't already, visit, visit biggerpockets.com slash partnerships to uh, see mine and Tony's new book, Real Estate Partnerships. Noah also shares a really interesting story, and you're, you're going to love hearing this, about some creative ways to finance your real estate deals. Ash and I talk a lot about different strategies we've used, but I really love what he did. So you'll really want to make sure to pay attention for that piece as well. Noah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Can you kind of get us started with how you got started in real estate? And maybe even before that, what were you doing before real estate? Um, so first, I really, I just want to thank you guys for having me on. Um, this podcast has been a huge inspiration to me over the years. So, you know, to be on here speaking is like, it's really surreal. Um, but yeah, uh, a, a little bit about me. My name is Noah Spremont. I'm 25 years old. I was born and raised in Dubuque, Iowa. Uh, three years ago, my fiance and I were living in my parents' basement when we decided to, uh, you know, that we wanted to buy a fix fixer upper house. And, um, Fast forward to today, uh, we have a small portfolio of single family and multifamily properties. Um, we have a mixed batch of short term and long term rentals. We self manage everything um, together. I work in the business full time, and uh, she works uh, full time at her W 2 job to, you know, kind of provide us with a secure paycheck while I'm able to uh, risk the income we make from the business and continue to grow the business. Noah, there is a lot I want to to get into on that. But first of all, congratulations on, you know, being a, a real estate investor and actually taking that leap and growing your portfolio. What about when you were living in your parents' basements before you took those steps to start investing in real estate? What were you doing before that? So, I mean, out of high school, I was, you know, pretty frustrated, like most kids probably that, that can't really find what they want to do and maybe feel indemnified for it. So I spent a lot of time uh, probably watching YouTube videos and doing stuff like that during those older, early days. I actually, I actually stumbled into some of the earlier bigger pocket stuff, you know, a long time ago and would watch, you know, Brandon Turner talking about um, doing those things. So that's really cut what kind of got the gears turning. Um, I guess, um, you know, before, right before we lived in my parents' basement, we rented a house with five other friends of ours and we were the ones that kind of put the deal together. So that really kind of got us thinking about, you know, if we can get creative with, uh, our living arrangement, I guess we can potentially lower the cost, uh, our monthly living expense. And, um, one thing led to another. We basically said, okay, if we can do that with a rental property, maybe we can do this with a house that we buy and own. And instead of paying rent each month, we can be paying a mortgage down. And I mean, we just kind of, you know, from my parents' basement, we moved into there after that rental house to start saving money. And uh, we really just started learning, talking with the bank and, you know, listening to more of the podcasts and stuff like that. And um, 
talking with realtors, looking at houses, and then really just pushing. Um, we didn't have a whole lot of money at the time, so we kind of felt like we were doing something that we shouldn't be doing, but we just really kept pushing until we got into that first property. Yeah. No, you, you talked a little bit about uh, like not knowing exactly what you wanted to do with your life, which is a super common feeling for a lot of people. You know, I know Ash went to school for one thing. She's doing something different. You know, I, I switched my majors during my junior year of college. Um, so I think everyone kind of goes through that phase. But I, I guess once you were done with high school, what did you kind of put yourself into from a work position? Like, like how did you decide how to spend your time, I guess? Um, so, yeah, out of high school or towards the end of high school, I was really money motivated and I wanted to find somewhere where, you know, I could be just making more money. And that kind of led me to just hop on my hop on the internet and Google, um, you know, what's the highest paying job for somebody that doesn't have any experience and is under 18. And, you know, the first thing that popped up was concrete labor. And I'm like, you know, no emotion. I just didn't think about it or anything. I Google concrete companies in Dubuque and I just started calling everybody asking if they had a spot open or if they could hire a, a kid like me. And um, the first few were like, you know, you could come and sweep the br shop, you know, once or twice a week for, you know, 10 bucks an hour or something. They really didn't want to put me on because I was, you know, not old enough to operate equipment and stuff like that yet. And then, um, you know, the third one I called, I think they just like looked right past it and were like, be here at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning and you got a job. <laughs> <laughs> no and, uh, where i feel like yeah. that would happen like not like today because i've been waiting for concrete to get poured forever but my contractor keeps having trouble finding you know people he can't get jobs done fast enough because he needs laborers but um what time frame was this how long ago was this when this happened so i was probably a junior in high school so it was like a year before i i ended up you know graduating and um yeah it was, I think I started in the summer in between two years and that's how I was able to be there at 5am the next day. That, I just, I, I just want to pause you for a second though, because I think there's a lesson for our, our rookies that are listening. So even though 99% of our audience is probably not a junior in, in high school, um, I, I think the lesson that we can take away from this is that A, uh, it, <laughs> if you want to find some some skills that are relevant to being a real estate investor, just pick up the phone and start calling people, right? Like that's a, a super just kind of gritty way to, to kind of get that, that job experience. But B it's like you, you can use this work experience to fuel your uh, ambitions of being a real estate investor. There are a lot of people right now who aren't in love with their day job. And if that's the case and you're not in a position to go into your real estate business full time, then why not transition into a, a line of work that will set you up to be a better real estate investor? And th that doesn't necessarily mean becoming an, an agent. Um, it's like if you could pick up skills like, you know, concrete work or like, I guess, no, did you do any other work that was related to real estate investing that kind of helps you build that confidence? So yeah, over the years, um, you know, since then, I've worked in a, a few different um, construction trades, which really kind of hammered out the hard work aspect. Um, but you know, after the construction stuff, I ended up, uh, getting into some sales spots, um, which was, was really awesome. I kind of got the hard work thing, you know, figured out. And then, um, I, uh, wanted more out of life, I guess, and seen some of my friends with their, um, you know, more cleaner jobs. They didn't have to get their hands dirty. And I, you know, kind of wanted to get into that a little bit and, uh, you know, started getting into why well, I actually ended up getting my health insurance license and uh, started working for a supplemental health insurance company, which um, we were selling supplemental health products door to door uh, on the road. So I was basically on the road, staying in hotels Monday through Thursday. And uh, I would, I would be knocking on doors and, you know, that kind of piled on top of the hard work added me to, or allowed me to get a lot better at that face-to-face -face interaction and talking with people and dealing with people. And, um, I bet there's a lot of investors listening right now and be like, hey, you want to come source deals for me? <laughs> you already that's have that exactly what I'm thinking experience. right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly what I'm thinking right now. But I, I think, Noah, you, you kind of, you, you got into the point that I was making is that you, you did these different things. You took these different jobs, obviously with the intention of putting food on the table, but also with this idea of like, okay, can, can these skills kind of support me in this bigger vision? And the, the point that I was making earlier was that 
if you're in a job right now that you don't like, why not try and find a slightly different career path, still a day job, still a W2 job, but one that's going to support you in being a better real estate investor? Can you go work for, like you said, a, a roofing company? Can you go work for your local HVAC company? Can you go work for, uh, I don't know, like a, a, a flipper who needs help, you know, managing their projects or, or sourcing their deals? Like I would assume, Noah, that between all these different jobs you kind of took, like, some of those skills transferred over some of the, the the lessons you learned on those jobs transferred over like if you think back what are what are some of those moments for you so the wildest part about that is it you know it kind of ended up giving me the the skills i need but um i mean really at the during the time i, I had no idea you know i was gaining those skills i was really just ending up in these positions where i was chasing the money and then i was handed these things that I had to get over, like getting over, knocking on the door, you know, getting over a little bit of sweat and pain while I work. And, um, yeah, over time, it just, it, it's crazy how, you know, it's kind of all come together. And, um, you know, I, I, it definitely wasn't planned by any means, but when I was handed those things that were probably like a little difficult, you know, I just kind of kept running at them and, you know, kept my head down and just kept doing what I thought I should do. And then when you finally kind of look up, you know, you, you've gotten over those things that were once scary to you. And so Noah, is there a certain principle that you live by that you, you follow is kind of, you know, how you lead your life? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. Um, you know, after the concrete or in between kind of some of that, I ended up working on a roofing construction job site and, um, that was just a whole other ball game in terms of hard work. You're a little, uh, I like to say when you're doing concrete, you're, you know, you're kind of lower when you're on the roof, you're a lot closer to the sun. So it's a little hotter up there, <laughs> um, yeah. but totally different, you know, ballpark when it comes to the labor. Um, I ended up, you know, working for my, my, um, fiance's, uh, mother's boyfriend. Um, he had ran this, you know, roofing company for a while, small company, just uh, one crew. Um, and basically we would, he would pick up, you know, a few guys from jail every morning on work release. And it was basically me, him, two other guys that were probably facing some wild sentence and just had, you know, a little bit of time between now and their court date to work. And, um, we would, you know, go around in rural Wisconsin actually, and, you know, do these roofs and, I really picked that that up easily because I had done the concrete in the past, so I fit right in there. And um, over time, you know, he would have these people coming and going, and eventually, you know, one day he, this mom actually dropped off her son. He looked a little bit too young to be working with us, and you know, I'm up on the roof working, and the boss kind of yells down to this kid, you know, the kid that probably shouldn't have been there. And he starts yelling at him to pick up the shingles, right? Because we're stripping the shingles off the roof. And um, this pile, you know, it's probably five or six foot tall. You know, it's like a huge pile of shingles. I'm just working away. And eventually I'm like, you know, just kind of wondering. It's not being picked up. I look down. The kid's crying. You know, he's sitting there just kind of bawling his eyes out. And I look over at Ben and I'm just like, you know, what's going on? And he looks at me and he's just like, Noah. If you look at something you've never done in your life, it just is going to play games with your head. You know, it just messes with your head. And um, he sent me down the ladder to go pick up that pile of shingles. And, you know, I kind of had a little bit of pride because he, you know, called me in to go do the job or whatever. And I climbed down the ladder and just start picking up those shingles as fast as I can, like I always did. And that pile was gone in 10 minutes. I mean, it was if you just focus on it for a little bit and kind of ignore the big, you know, giant thing, um, it disappears, you know, and, um, it really, you know, really kind of set into me that like, no matter what it is, if you come across something that's just like making your mind spin, it's probably just your mind playing games with you, you know? So you take that and apply it to a fixer upper house, um, you get into this project that you probably thought you had no business in. And, um, if you just do it one shingle at a time, is kind of what I taught myself, you know, pick it up 
one at a time, do the thing that you know you can do and do your best at it. Um, eventually, you know, on a rehab, it's a list of items. That pile of shingles, it's a pile of shingles. So, you know, you can connect it to the one shingle is, you know, one item off that list. And um, over time, if you keep picking up shingles, keep crossing items off those lists, eventually you're going to run out of shingles to pick up and you're going to run out of things to do on that list. And that's when, you know, the deal is going to be done and you can go to the bank and refinance it. So Noah, was your first property, did you have to do a rehab for it? Uh, yeah. So the first property we bought, I had a little bit of experience in construction, but I had really no experience in, uh, you know, renovating a house. So we had done new construction most mostly. And um, it sounds like those skills should be like directly transferable. But like I was pretty lost when I got into the to the first project. Um, well, it seems like you did like specialty skills, too. It's to instead of like general contractor, it was, you know, you had worked in the specialties. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, the first project we bought is, uh, you know, from my parents basement. We can go back to there single family fixer upper house. Um, not really, it was on the MLS, but it probably shouldn't have been a wholesaler had gotten a hold of it, um, through a lady that was behind on her taxes. And he just basically took the old MLS pictures and listed it. He never even visited the property. He just, you know, put it on the market. And, you know, I, I circled past it four or five times and eventually was like, this looks like it's, you know, probably something that we could try. And the, the big, problem with it was the sewage pipe was cracked. So the bank didn't want to finance it. Um, just resident. Did like, you just know that design. ahead of time? Did the wholesaler tell you that, or that's something you found out during an inspection? So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the pipe was visibly cracked in the basement. So, uh, during the walkthrough, I could see the crack and, you know, I kind of just was emotional probably about it and was like, Oh, I can fix that or I'll get that fixed. It'll be easy. And, um, we just really kept pushing, but when the inspection came back or the appraisal came back for the bank, they classified it as uh, C5 or something like that. It's basically just out of the threshold to be resold on the secondary market, you know, for a mortgage or whatever. And so let's um, talk about that real quick. So when you go and do bank financing, you have the inspection per period from like if you're doing an FHA loan or maybe a construction loan, something like that. But if you're doing just a conventional loan product, there isn't really typically any kind of inspection. So what you're talking about was done from the appraisal. So when the appraiser actually comes to the property, he is classifying it. And that's how the bank is deciding if they're actually going to loan on the product, too. So kind of talk about that process. Did you expect that that could even happen, that the bank wouldn't loan on the property? And what loan product were you using? Yeah, so I really you know, like had no experience in this stuff. So I had really no idea what they were talking about when they came back to me with, uh, you know, we can't finance this. It's a C5. And um, the loan product we were using was just a standard residential uh, owner occupy loan. So, you know, in order to qualify it and push it through, they really had to make sure that it was a livable residence. Um, and you know, we can kind of go into detail about how we got around that. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. I, I just want to call out one thing, Noah, because you said that um, it, the the loan couldn't get resold on the second secondary market. Um, it, can you just explain what that means for folks that aren't familiar with that? So I'm probably not the person to explain this. I'm just repeating what they kind of told me. But uh, <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's to my understanding that you know these smaller banking institutions and credit unions are basically just making these mortgages and they're, you know, selling them to larger institutions that use them as a vehicle to make an investor a return. Um, so in order for um, them to be able to resell my mortgage, um, the risk has to be low enough, you know, for the investors that are on the other end of that deal to, you know, take it on. Yeah. Great, great description. Noah. And yeah, like, like you said, most of these banks, like when you usually when you get a, a mortgage, um, the person who sold you that mortgage, they might service it for like a month and then you'll get like a new loan servicer like shortly thereafter. So they're just kind of originating that loan and then selling it off to, to someone else. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of these banks do kind of have 
guidelines that aren't even necessarily their own banks, but it's like, hey, if we want to be able to resell this, whether it's a, a Fannie or, or Freddie loan, there's certain boxes they have to check to be able to push that loan off to someone else. Now, there are some... I found it really common that if you use a mortgage broker, that it's more likely to be resold than if you're actually going to like a smaller bank um, that will kind of keep it in-house too. I've had one loan that has changed four times. I got it in 2017 and it's changed four times to different <laughs> loan crazy. servicers. They're yeah. just moving it around. Huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you, you made a good point, Ash. And that's what I was going to comment on. It's that sometimes the, the smaller banks, they'll keep those loans in-house. Um, like the bank that I worked with in Shreveport when I first got started, they didn't resell any of their their mortgages. They they kept it in house. So depends on which bank you're working with. Yeah. So Noe, you couldn't get the financing, and how did you end up getting around that? So I was kind of um, told no. Really, they basically just said no. We're not going to finance this. You know, keep looking. Sorry. Um, and I went to some of the investors from the local REI meetup that I attend. And just kind of ask them like, Hey, you know, you told me to come to you when I had a question, I got a question and I don't know how to, uh, you know, get this pushed through. I really think the house is a great deal and I really think I can make it work, but, um, the bank won't find it. Uh, did you put in any kind of earnest money when you got this property under contract that you were worried about losing if you didn't make this deal go through? So I think it was like $500 in earnest money and, um, I, I wasn't really even thinking about losing it because I was, you know, gonna make it go through. Yeah, <laughs> so it never yeah, that's awesome <laughs> mindset really to have. crossed my mind. But uh, yeah, so my one friend ended up saying, "Well, what if you know you you approach the bank and you said, here's a contractor's bid of all the items that need to be done to fix the house up to get it to a C4, so it's livable and stuff, and then." You know, what if you took that money and just gave it to them, put it in escrow account and said, if I don't close on this house and fix these items to get it to a C4, uh, you guys can take that money, execute it with this contractor and fix the house yourself. If I do fix it with my money and everything, um, you know, you guys can just release those funds back to me. So I went to the bank and asked them if they do that. And they said, sure. Yeah. Get us the bid. And, um, you know, being in the, profession I was in previously. Um, I had a lot of friends that were contractors. So I just called up, you know, one of my better friends and went to his house and sat down at his dinner table. And we wrote out, you know, this nice long bid that was, um, it was, we were able to make the bid a lot smaller because, you know, I'll say in quotations, I had a lot of the materials already, you know, so we were able to make the bid, you know, look a lot smaller than it actually probably should have been. That way I didn't have to set aside too much money because I didn't really have a lot of cash at the time. So said and done, it was $900 to um, get it to be a C4. And I submitted the, you know, the bid, the contractor's bid with the bank. And I don't, honestly don't think they even looked at it. <laughs> I think they just, you know, they said, okay, we're good. You know, it's all good to go. Closing dates here. And, and that's when I was just like, whoa, you know, this is crazy. So that big takeaway right there, like, don't take no for an answer, like yeah. find how to overcome that obstacle. But I, I think it's also, and Ash, we, we talk about this a lot too, it's just like the the flexibility you get when working with some of those smaller local banks. It's like, I, I couldn't walk into Bank of America and, and offer that same deal and the teller be like, yeah, I can make that work, you know? <laughs> yeah. But it's like when you when you go to a smaller local bank, you you have that. So no, what happens next? You figure out the whole financing piece with this really creative strategy. What, what happens from there? Um, so it, 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 I would hate to gloss over this, but we actually ended up working uh seller credit into the deal. And then we, the, the bank that we were working with off offered a class to lower the, I think they call them the LLPAs. There were some little fees associated with the closing cost. So if I took this class, um, they would take $1,200 off or whatever. And then, uh, we got a $7,500 seller credit. And what was that class about? Like, what did you actually learn in it that they would take those closing fees off? It was just a 30 minute online class about home ownership. So it was basically $1,200 like, for 30 minutes. <laughs> for 30 minutes? <laughs> yeah. Oh, <damn. laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, when I. And it was so about like owning a home and like how to, you know, be responsible and make your mortgage like, payment or. You got to right, have. I got to. Well, go ahead. No, I got to ask the question because I feel like every rookie listening to this is going to want to know what, like, what's the name of this bank that you were working with? 
So this is uh, Depaco Credit Union. So um, they're you know rock stars. Depaco Credit Union. All right, Depaco Credit Union just got put on the map by the by the Real Estate Ricky <laughs> podcast. When I when I was a guest back on episode ten, I talked about the credit union that I used in Shreveport for my first deal, and I literally got a call like a few days after my episode aired from uh, my like the vice president of that bank. She was like, Tony, I don't know what you did or what you said, but my phone has not stopped ringing like all week. So there you go, man. We'll, we'll do the same for that credit yeah, union. That, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So what happened next? Yeah. So yeah, we got the house, you know, closed. It was the wildest day, you know, probably of my life during the time. Um, like pre- just shortly before we ended up closing on the house, we, you know, went and got a small personal loan to kind of stock up our cash pile. And um, it was only like $3,000. And then uh, when we ended up, you know, closing on the property, Having no experience, you know, going into a closing, I didn't ask for a closing statement ahead of time or anything or never really even got it. We didn't really know how much money we had to come up with until we were like there like the day before. And um, they showed us that number and it was it was like thirty two hundred dollars. And it was it was so eye opening, you know, for me to have spent, you know, so much time renting and everything like that to just like, you know, put that small amount of money down, which isn't getting thrown away anyways. It's going into that loan. It's a down payment. And, um, you know, just, you know, have a mortgage payment the next month. That's smaller than my old rent payment. Um, but yeah, from there, that's amazing. Yeah. We ended up, uh, from my parents' basement. I, I was actually working as a motorcycle salesman at a Harley Davidson dealership. And I would get off at like four or five o'clock and come straight to this. I would actually change in the bathroom there and then come straight to this property um, to renovate every night. And it was probably a long, slow process because I had no experience with, you know, doing the sequence of events properly and stuff like that. So I'm bouncing around this house, you know, painting one wall and then painting the other wall and, you know, tearing some flooring out and just, you know, doing what I thought I had to do to get it up and running. And, um, Over a little bit of time, we kind of had it to the point where it wasn't moving ready, but like I was at work one day and my fiance just got tired of living in my parents' basement. She just went around me and just started moving the stuff in (laughs) and uh, (laughs) she's like, yeah, we're all moved in. And I got off work that day and, you know, we were all moved in. At the time, we had only renovated the main floor of the house. So the top floor had still sat um, looking like how it's looked since the probably the sixties. Um, so, um, we moved right into the lower unit and, you know, continued to work our W twos and, um, you know, continued to kind of learn about real estate. No, was that your plan is to push off moving in so that you didn't have to help move and that your girlfriend had to do it? (laughs) Honestly, it was totally against my wishes. I had to like caulk some trim yet. And I knew that if she started moving stuff in, that that stuff would never, ever get done. And <laughs> to this day, like I'm sitting in the unit right now yeah. and I can look around and the trim is not cocked and it kind of drives me <laughs> nuts. And I blame that is her. so true though. Like I am sitting in the cabin that I remodeled and I was like, I've got to get stuff in here. And so there are little things like that are not done. Like the water isn't hooked up to the fridge for the ice maker. Like, I feel like that's just never going to happen because like the food is, the fridge is full of food, like whatever, <laughs> like little that you are so right about that. Like once you move into the property, it's like how much stuff is actually, you know, going to get done those little tiny things. So let's continue to talk about your real estate journey. Um, so tell us about some of the other properties and experiences you have had as an investor. Um, so yeah, from there, I, you know, I kind of knew I liked fixing houses and stuff like that. I really didn't have a complete idea that it was what I was going to do. Um, I had started attending the local REI meetup, you know, listening to more bigger pockets podcasts. And eventually one of the guys from the meetup kind of approached me and was like, you know, I got this deal I'm looking at. I really want to do it. Uh, Another, another guy from the meetup brought it to him and he was like, 
just kind of telling me about it and asking me if I thought he should do it. And I just responded with like, I'm in, like, I want to, I want to be a part of this. And, um, it's just, a totally gutted duplex, um, $30,000 purchase price. And the roof had just been done, and the previous owner had gutted it and packed it full of materials for the rehab. So, you know, we're looking at this really creative situation where we could potentially save a ton of money by using the materials that are already here. And, um, you know, it, the purchase price worked out for the the ARV, the after repair value. And, um, yeah, basically, he approached me. And, you know, he was going to do it himself. I told him, you know, I, I wanted to partner with him on it, which is kind of a little different how, how that went. Um, but basically, we kind of landed on him being the money and me, me being the labor. And I was, you know, kind of faced with this difficult decision. The only way that I was going to able or be able to, like, bring to the table what I needed to bring to the table was if I quit my W-2 job and just went, you know, kind of full force into this deal to kind of get it done. I was just going to say, Tony and I love talking about partnerships, so we definitely want to dive into that (laughs) partnership. But before we go further into this partnership and what happened with this property as to what strategy are you turning these properties into? So your your first house hack and then this one, are you doing short term? Are you doing long term rentals, midterm rentals? At the time, I had never like the short term rental thing had never even crossed my mind. So it was like entirely, uh, you know, just going to be a long term rental thing. So with the first property, your house hacking, you turned that into a short-term rental. I started the second deal in the middle of renovations at this project. So we renovated the main floor, moved into it. And I had every intention to renovate the top floor until this friend of mine approached me with that next deal and asked, you know, we kind of worked out the situation where I'd, you know, get half of the equity if I was the labor end of the deal. And then, you know, he brought the money or raised the capital and I didn't have to worry about any of the money. I was able to, you know, kind of buy the materials I needed to do the rehab throughout the whole process. And uh, that was his deal. And then, um, yeah, uh, it's a long four months of, you know, me at the time I had a 1991 rusted out S10 single cab, five speed pickup, <laughs> you know, that barely made it to the job site. And, you know, I had no tools. So I was bar- I was actually borrowing tools from my money partner. So he had tools because he was a an HVAC technician. So he had all these like, you know, kind of regular tools that everybody really needs to do pretty much anything. And, you know, he loaned those out to me in a book bag. And, you know, <laughs> basically I had a few battery chargers in a book bag and a little tool bag that I would, you know, carry from my house to my truck bed to the job site. And then at the end of the day, I'd have to load all that back into my truck and then, um, you know, drive it all home. And yeah, it took me four months. I was the only one that really worked on the project. We had uh, licensed subs for the plumbing and electric. And um, yeah, throughout the process, it's pretty funny. The There was a auto shop right across the street from this property. And one of the days my truck didn't start when I went to leave. So I actually like went over to the auto shop, got some help, pushed it across the street and walked home <laughs> and then, like got a rod to the job site like the next day, worked all day and then went and paid for my truck bill and uh, drove the truck home. So, OK, so while you're doing this, this is where you're you also finish up the project at your your house hack, too. And so what made you decide to turn that into a short term rental? And how did that kind of end up the numbers? The house hack project was still, you know, the second floor was still just sitting um, pretty disgusting. And um, we ended up wrapping up the duplex with the money partner. And we, you know, we had it all lined up with the bank from the get go. So we basically told them, here's what we're going to do. Here's where we're going to come to you and try to refinance and or finance because we did it all in cash. And then... Um, you know, here's the timeline. So, you know, when, since we did that ahead of time, it, it, it just worked out like so magically, you know, we hit the nail right on the head in terms of the timeline, reached out to the bank, said, Hey, we need an appraisal. This place is all done and leases are signed and everything. And, you know, they triggered the appraisal two weeks later, uh, the appraisal comes back at like 130,000, which is a little bit beyond our expectations. Uh, we cashed out like 26 grand and split it. And, 
that at the time was the biggest payday, you know, I'd ever experienced in my entire life. So it was like really mind boggling and life changing. And that's kind of when I realized that, you know, I did that and sure, $12,000 in, you know, four months might not seem like a lot to other people. But to me at the time, it was like, it was incredible. You know, I walked away with uh, a turnkey duplex that um, was cash flowing close to $1,000 a month. Um, and then, yeah, I got the $12,000 paycheck. I basically was like, yeah, this is definitely what I'm doing for the rest of my life. But um, so I took that 12K and, you know, now we're re-indemnified or we have a bunch of money in our bank account. And that's when I dove into the air, the upper unit here and really just started renovating. Um, there was kind of this like mother-in-law kitchen up there. So that's what really gave us the idea to put the kitchen back and kind of make it a second apartment. And there had already been a deck on the back side with a set of steps that went down. Um, so we ended up, so you had you know, your set your entrance so that they didn't have to go the same way as you. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, it, it's crazy cause we had the big idea to make it a duplex cause we thought like, okay, it already, it already is a duplex, but we ended up redoing all that stuff anyways. So, <laughs> I mean, basically all the plumbing, all the electric, we had to rebuild the deck and put a new out, put a new door in and everything. And, um, then, you know, we got that done. Actually, it was like, it's, it was pretty interesting timing because I ended up going to, uh, the BP con 2021 and, um, I actually got a picture with you there, Tony, <laughs> which is <laughs> super cool. <laughs> um, uh, you, uh, you really inspired me, you know, I, I was in the middle of renovating the unit. I think I had the idea to turn it into a long-term rental and then BP Con 2021 happened like right before I was able to finish that unit. And I think you said like, I don't know, something about getting to X amount of short-term rentals in two years. And I was just like, what? Like if you can get to that, like I can get to 10. You know, I so love this story right now. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you did. But yeah, no, it's, it really inspired yeah. me and like, if I think oh, back on it, man. I mean, I, I hadn't, I was so excited to just get home and turn this into like the coolest Airbnb ever and, you know, list it. And so you did know, it work did. or did it? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it being a bad idea. Bad idea. Got, got home, you know, went crazy, got super creative with the furniture and decoration budget and um, ended up listing it. I think the first month it did like 2,500 bucks in gross income. And how much did you pay for this house again? And you were all in and with your rehab costs, everything. What was the total amount? So it was a hundred and seven thousand dollar purchase price. That's insane. Eighteen hundred square foot single family house with a one car garage and the it had two HVAC systems before I got into it. So two furnaces, two ACs, two thermostats. Um, and so what's your mortgage payment on that? Uh, it's, I think it's like. 600 and something. No <laughs> word. Yeah. And that is insane. And then uh, is that one of those three point something interest rates. Uh, no, dude. First, like, I, I appreciate that story, man. And uh, I had no no idea that, you know, our, our interaction had that, that impact on you, brother. But kudos to you, man, for, for taking the action. Because, you know, Ash and I talk with tons of people uh, at BPCon. And I can guarantee that the majority, unfortunately, probably don't take action on, on kind of what, what happens and what's said there. But the fact that you, you know, kind of came back home on fire pays dividends, man. 2,500 bucks on a $600 mortgage. Crazy, crazy good, man. And oh, let me ask you this. Is there any kind of like attraction near you? Like why is your short-term rental doing so good? It, at the time there hadn't been any in this area and really kind of asking a lot of my friends, they were really like, you're crazy for that. Um, but just seeing, you know, kind of in bigger markets, how they've been more successful and seeing other hosts like yourself, you know, have success. I, I was really willing to kind of take the leap and have faith in, you know, the platform and the amount of people that actually visit that platform. And I really, there's, you know, probably not a lot of tourist things for people to visit this, you know, city, but like everybody wants Every, you know, people have family and families get married and have birthdays and they do all these things. And like 
everybody, I, I have this belief that if you don't stay in Airbnbs, you just need to learn that you probably want to stay at Airbnbs or short-term rentals. So over time, you know, I just think more and more people will be converting from that hotel mindset to just the short-term rental mindset. And that's pretty much kind of what I was focused on capitalizing on was just people moving and wanting a better way to stay when they, you know, move around. Well, that's exactly to my short-term rentals. There is no attraction. There's a ski resort, maybe 30 minutes away. Niagara Falls is like an hour away, but there's like nothing centrally located right there. But the majority of our guests are coming for a wedding. Um, we had grandparents stay for two months because they were visiting their grandkids for the summer, um, coming for the, the all class reunion. Like a lot of it is just, there's one tiny little rinky dink hotel that has awful reviews and there's maybe three or four other short-term rentals. And some of them are just a bedroom or they're not updated at all. So like, that's just like another opportunity there. Just like you had Noah is to like, there's not a ton of options and you can capitalize on that. We do got the field of dreams. That's oh, like, really? <laughs> that's like a oh, half a- cool. That is, yeah, that's an attraction for sure. I don't know what that is. I'm sorry, no, educate <laughs> me. What's the field of dreams? Tony yeah. doesn't know movies. So it's uh, <laughs> no. a movie, a baseball movie that was shot uh, pretty, really close to uh, Dubuque in a city called Dyersville. And um, it was, I don't know the exact year they released the movie, but, you know, it was before I think I was bored. And- Throughout my entire life, like the place has been like not that popular. And then just in the last few years, they start, they started really dumping a, a lot of money into it and hosting like Cubs games and all these games. And now I think, um, like even our city like spends money on that whole operation because they bring people into Dubuque too, just because of all the, it's really blowing up out there. I haven't been out there to visit since they've kind of, uh, blown up but uh yeah, yeah. i want to get but, out there but it just goes to show you know and, and this is something that i've been i've been talking a lot about uh is that i think the the next shift in the short-term rental space is going after some of these uh kind of secondary and tertiary markets that maybe wouldn't be your first guest at, you know it's like hey here's a good place to set up a short-term rental um so it seems like dubuque could be uh be one of those places man so you're gonna you're gonna have people coming into dubuque setting up uh, short-term rentals and going to that that um uh, uh, credit union that you talked about, man. So you're, you're building some of your own competition right now. Okay. So Noah, let's uh, kind of wrap up here with the rest of your portfolio. So you did the short-term rental. The second one that you did with your partnership, um, did that end up being short-term rental too? Uh, so that ended up, you know, just being a long-term. Oh rentals. yeah. The flip. The, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a flip. And then what have you done uh, since then? Basically got the Airbnb going upstairs. Um, at the place that I live at. And then, you know, we had that place totally wrapped up in terms of renovations. So we were, you know, kind of looking to refinance it and pull out some of that equity. So, you know, we went to the bank and told them we were ready to, you know, try to do a refi. And actually it's a funny story. Basically the bank that we were banking at uh, to see us, you know, they, they see two kids that are like 20 years old at the time or 21. And they said, there's, there's no way in that short amount of time that you improve the value this much, you know? And we said, we wanted, or said that we guessed it would appraise around $170,000. And I don't know if anybody's ever dealt with this, but I've never even heard of it. The bank, they didn't necessarily say no, but they were just like, it's not going to appraise for that. Just like over email, which being not that experienced was like, kind of like, okay, they said no. Um, I ended up when we refinanced the second property, we did it with a different bank. So at the time I'm banking with two banks. I just went over to the other bank and said, Hey, you know, this first place won't refinance my loan. I think it's worth $170,000. Uh, you know, would you guys like to, you know, refinance this project? They're like, Sweet. We'll send an appraiser out. And I think what's what's even crazy there, though, no, is that the first bank didn't even want to send an, an appraisal, you know, to, to get the appraisal done. Because, I mean, that's business for the bank. At a minimum, they want to at least validate that. But now you just took your business somewhere else and, and was able to kind of get what you needed there. Yeah, for me, it was just confusing because it's like I pay for the appraisal anyways. So, you know, um, 
moving forward, I only work with banks and people who are, you know, oriented like that. Like, okay, like yeah. let's not get emotional about it. Let's just do the, you know, thing that we need to do. Um, so anyways, the second bank sends their appraisal or sends the appraiser out and appraisal comes back at 190 thousand which was yeah a good amount more than kind of what we anticipated on and um did you go back to that first bank and say i told you so <laughs> no 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 but it's it's funny because over over I just, time i just would have emailed them the appraisal <laughs> with no subject line no nothing that's kind of funny because over time i've actually ended up working back with that original bank for the last few projects so um yeah anyways we were able to cash out a lot more than we expected we would which was Another one of those moments where it, you know, really set into me that like, this is, you know, what I love to do and um, this is what I'm going to do. And it's up to this point, it had given me more freedom than anything in my life. And although it had, had probably been harder than anything in my life, um, I felt, I felt compensated. So Noah, to, to kind of end this here, what is some advice that you can give our listeners as far as maybe three things that they should be doing today to, you know, manage a rehab project or anything to do with a rehab? What do you think are the three most important things uh, an investor should be doing today to make it a successful rehab? So, you know, number one, in my opinion, it, it has to be taken action. A lot of the time, you know, we want to sit on the sidelines or procrastinate. We might not even know we're procrastinating just because we think we can't do that laborious thing. You know, I come across it so much where, you know, some of my investor friends are like, well, I have to wait to get this done because it's, you know, the, the grass needs to be mowed or something. And it's like, just go do it, you know, and especially when you're trying to get started and you're starting from not a lot of capital, um, even if it's not your thing or you're not good at it, it's probably a little counterintuitive to a lot of the advice given out on the show. But I mean, a lot of the times you just have to go do it and get it done and then hope that someday that you'll be able to pay people to do that you know, monotonous task. Um, another one would be, you know, and this is, I always told myself if I was ever asked this question by you guys, I would say this, you got to listen to this podcast. I mean, you got to consume as much information as you possibly can consume, especially when it's free. In today's day and age, there's not a lot of people out there that are giving out handouts. And I really feel like this platform, this podcast gives out a lot of handouts and um, you got to take them when they're given out. Um, you know, and the third one would be, yeah, those, those phone calls are going to come in and everybody knows what I'm talking about and they have their own version of whatever that, that phone call is. You got to stay positive when you get the bad news. You have to. And there's going to be days where you want to sell it all and, uh, it'll be gone in, in a short amount of time if you just stay positive. So just keep in mind that, you know, you, in a short amount of time, I'll be laughing that I wanted to sell everything. <laughs> yeah, I, I I feel the same way as, you know, there are those difficult phone calls that you can get. And one thing I've learned is like, okay, every rehab is putting on, you know, baking in that extra 20% of overages. And I am expecting to spend that amount. So when something does happen or something comes up, it's like, okay, yep, here's the money. I have it set aside. This is what this money is for because money can fix a lot of problems. So if you have your reserves in place, um, you know, that, that makes me feel a lot better. And I, I sleep better at night. And also I don't get myself so worked up and like emotional about, Oh my God, why is this happening to me and want to sell everything. So that that's been a big help for me. And then, you know, if those things don't happen, like, yay, I went, you know, $10,000 under budget. Yay. This is awesome. You know? So, um, that's helped me a lot. It's like having that many money as set aside and having in my mindset that that money is to be spent on those things. Yeah. So another few, you know, great lessons I learned during, you know, the, that time was, um, you know, one of the projects I closed on was, <laughs> right in the middle of the coldest part of the year in this part of the country. And it was a, it was a really valuable lesson where I thought, you know, I can, I can tough this out, but, um, it was like probably negative 20 the day I closed. And, um, you know, I had a long rehab ahead of me that, uh, we had no heat and the house actually had no windows and no electric at the time. So, you know, there was uh, a lot of days where, you know, basically I really had no choice, but to, uh, stay moving. 
Yeah, layer up. I did a, a rehab on a four unit and it was, I mean, it was probably 20 degrees out. Like it was cold, but not that cold at all. And I'm still in, you know, full Carhartt gear. I can't imagine below 20 degrees or, you know, my gosh. My brain can't even comprehend what negative 20 feels like. So, <laughs> and I'm saying this like as I'm sitting on the, the beach in California, you know, watching the waves crash. So it, it probably wasn't actually that cold, but like it felt like it was that cold. It was probably right Yeah, with the zero. wind chill and wind everything, shield. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 But yeah. yeah, no, like one day during that rehab, I'm just like trying my hardest to get this project done and, and, you know, kind of a little bit out of my comfort zone in terms of the level of rehab. And, you know, I was, I was really trying to work as fast as I possibly could. I, I ended up breaking a window and a bathtub in the same day on one of those really, really <laughs> cold days. And, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not going to lie. I sat down and I cried, you know, I just like kind of like curled up in a ball cause I was cold. And, um, you know, the cool part about that cold is, you know, you can only sit down for so long, you know? So I, I really, kind of had to just get up and continue to move around. And that, you know, made me get up, push that window out, you know, tear that tub out. And, you know, that night I was able to, you know, get up and kind of get that stuff actually replaced before I went home. And, you know, I ended up going home probably at 10 PM that night, but kept me moving, you know, kept me positive. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the transparency, brother. And you, you mentioned something I just want to highlight before we, we kind of wrap up here, but you, you talked about being a little bit outside of your comfort zone. And I think that's a, it's a really important concept for our rookies to understand is that all of us have some comfort zone that we live within. And the, the dangerous part is when we only stick with inside of that comfort zone. Now, you also don't want to go too far out where you're maybe overextending yourself to the point where it's, it's reckless, right? Or you're kind of in that danger zone to putting on too much to your plate. Um, but you, just outside of your comfort zone is a growth zone. And that's where you kind of want to try and focus. And, and that's where you find growth and that's where you get better and that's where you find success and that's where you find uh, just building new skills and, and all the things that are required to be successful. So if you're listening to this podcast and you feel like you have, haven't stretched outside of your comfort zone in a while, it's a sign that you might be stagnating a little bit. So I appreciate you sharing that, Noah. Now, I want to take us to our rookie request line before we let you go. Um, if you guys are listening and you want to get your question featured on the podcast, head over to biggerpockets.com slash reply, and uh, we just might use your question for the show. So today's uh, question comes from Stephen Rutherford, and Stephen's question is, for a proper bird, do you have to buy the house 100% cash and pay 100% cash for the uh, rehab and then do the refi, or can you do 20% down for the house and pay all cash for the rehab and then do a refi? So Noah, what's been your experience? Um, so I actually uh, read David Green's, you know, Burr book pretty early on. And I'm not going to lie, it kind of rubbed me wrong when he was like really toting that the best way to, to do that, to do a Burr is to uh, come up with all the cash ahead of time and, um, you know, do it that way and then finance it. Now, this might be just because I'm dealing with smaller banking institutions and credit unions, but I have never ran into any sort of issues with uh, seasoning periods. So um, I see a lot more uh, performance or success and putting the 20% down, financing the house, you know, originally, and then going back and refinancing it. Um, that allows you to, instead of having to, you know, come up with all the cash for a hundred percent of the purchase price, you can maybe save the cash that you have and spend that on the rehab and then, you know, put, you know, 20% down. And then, um, the project's probably going to take three to six months anyways, if you're a rookie. So, um, as long as you kind of chat that out with the bank beforehand and they know your intentions, um, and you don't work with a bank that won't refinance in that short period of time, I, I don't. I don't see why it's, you know, a not a better way to necessity. Yeah. 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 It, yeah and, and just to add, add to that, uh, Noah, like for all, everyone that's listening, you can use whatever kind of debt you want for a burr. What's most important is that the spread between your purchase price and your rehab is big enough with your ARV. 
So if you're, you know, even if you pay cash for a house, if you pay cash for a house and say you buy it and you're all in for $100,000 for your purchase and your rehab, but the house is only going to appraise for $80,000, it's still a failed burr, right? But say that you use all debt and you, you're only in for 40000 and the house appraises for 100000 then you've got a, a decent spread there. So what's most important is the spread and, you know, can you kind of get your, your purchase and your rehab done uh, at a certain number? Um well, just one thing I want to clarify really quickly, Noah, you mentioned seasoning period. And uh, I don't think all of our rookies kind of know what that is. But um, I, I'd say most of the, the banks that I work with, even the, the smaller ones, um, required some sort of seasoning. So basically what this is, is that when you purchase a home, typically banks want to see that you've owned that property for at least six months before before they'll allow you to do a cash out refinance. A lot of times you can just do a, a refinance where you're changing the rate and not pulling any cash out. But if you want to do like where you're pulling equity out of your property, typically they want to see six months. But no, you're saying that some of these smaller banks that you're working with, they don't even hold you to that six month standard. Yeah, no, I've uh, been pretty fortunate to um, been able to you know get in and out of a project where I financed it and then refinance it within you know, even, even four months. Um, and the, the banker might say something about, you know, that's crazy or, you know, you proved the value that much. And, you know, that's when you can just, you know, fire back at him, the list of items that are completed and maybe some before and after pictures and say, if you don't want to refinance it, maybe I can, uh, take a walk down the street. <laughs> they might want to, <laughs> this is worth a lot more money now. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I kind of over time and this might change, but I've always told myself, you know, the best bank is probably the next bank. Um, and that's kind of how I've been treated. You know, the, the next bank always wants to win your business and, and get you over there. So, you know, worst case scenario, like Tony said, I could piggyback off that a little bit. As long as your margins are there, um, it, it really doesn't matter how you finance it or buy it and everything like that. As long as you have um, a great deal on your hands, um, you should be able to, you know, either a borrow money to take that thing down or um, b, you know, get the money from the bank or whatever. And if for whatever reason you're kind of running into uh, walls when it comes to that, your deal probably isn't making the returns it probably should, and you might need to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, it's it's like the example, you know, and a lot of people do this with interest rates too. Like, oh, I'm not going to buy property because I don't want to pay hard money 12% interest. Well, if you have no other way to buy the property, isn't it better to make $25,000 than nothing? And like, you know, like making something off of it if you can, if this, the deal still works. But if you're like, nope, I'm only going to do it if I if I get 30, but you know, this interest rate is only going to make me 25,000. If this is your first deal and you are going to make some money instead of nothing and it's still worthwhile, like what does it matter what interest rate you're making if you're making what you want to make? Well, Noah, thank you so much for taking the time today to come on the podcast. We really appreciated uh, you sharing your journey and your story with us and giving us lots of advice. Can you let everyone know where they can reach out to you and find out some more information about you? Uh, yeah. So I'm most active uh, probably on Instagram um, at Noah Spremont. That's N-O-A-H-S-P-R-I-M-O-N-T, no spaces. Um, and then you can, you know, you can find me on Facebook and stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, if you ever have any questions about what we do, we are completely transparent, even with, you know, all of our numbers and stuff. And we love to provide value in any way or shape or form that we can. So yeah, please feel free to ask. And uh, yeah, I would love to chat. Awesome, Noah. Thank you so much. I'm Ashley at Wealth from Rentals and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson. And we will be back on Saturday with a rookie reply. Still